We have been in church studying through the book of Ephesians, and we're going to continue that today. Uh, We have seen um, the goodness of God. We have seen the salvation of the Son. We have seen the sealing of the Spirit. And so now where does Paul go? Paul goes directly from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit to the church. That's important because Jesus bled and died to redeem Paul Christians who would make up the church. Uh, The church is important, and Paul prays for the church today. Uh, We're going to learn about Paul's prayer for the church, not just for the church at Ephesus, but Paul's prayer for the church overall, God's desire for the church, for us to know Him and love Him and walk in His Hour. And so we're going to read together today Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. If you're willing and able, I want to invite you to stand with me out of respect for God and His Word as we read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Paul writes, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of the revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and all authority and all power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that you have called us together uh, to worship you as the church this morning. And so, Father, we pray that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would shape us, that you would mold us, that you would help us to become more like Jesus through our time together today. Would you help us to have eyes that are open and hearts that are receptive to receive your word today? We pray for ourselves the words of Paul, that you would open the eyes of our hearts so that we may know what is the hope to which you have called us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated. Paul prays for four things. First, Paul prays a prayer of thanks, a prayer of thanksgiving. It seems, it seems pretty... Uh, fitting this time of year that Paul would pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, Seems normal to us, except that there wasn't thanksgiving when Paul was alive. That's a relatively new thing, but we ought to give thanks to God. Paul prays for thanks, for two things, really. First, he's thankful for the Christian's faith in God. He says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Paul knows of their faith because he's worked among the Christians of Ephesus. He has preached, he has evangelized, he has served, he has loved the people of this city. He has seen them come to know and follow Jesus. He has seen them grow, he has seen them struggle, he has seen them fall, and then he has seen them rise up again. And he knows their faith and he is thankful for it. He gives thanks for their faith. But he doesn't stop there. He says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. He is thankful for the Christian's love for one another. Paul gives thanks because he knows that the Christians in Ephesus don't just love God, they also love one another. Too often, Christians tend to fall or err on one side or the other. Some love God well but fail to love others. They become like the Pharisees of Jesus' day who love God and they love truth, but they fail to put it to work, and so they know the truth of God, but they fail to honor God. And others love others well. Other Christians love 
other people well, but they fail to love God well. And they're weak in their understanding of the Scriptures. And they don't understand the truth of God. And they become sentimental and they never have a kind of moral compass that they need. And they succeed in loving and honoring one another, but because of their sentimentality and all accepting uh, ideas, their love fails to address sin, and so they fail to honor God. I used to mistakenly believe that if I was going to err on one side or the other, I'd be better off to err on the side of loving God well and maybe not loving other people as well, but I've come to realize that it's not okay with God that we err on either side. That's why when someone came to Jesus and said, what's the most important law? What's the first commandment, the most important commandment, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus didn't say that this is the second most important commandment necessarily. What he's saying is these two things cannot be separated from one another. They cannot exist without one another. Paul seems to indicate that the Ephesians aren't erring on either side. They're loving God well and they're loving one another well. Their faith and love exist in balance and harmony. But do you think, this is just a, this is just a question, do you think that Paul sees this as perfectly as he communicates it? Because it seems like he doesn't have anything negative to say. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in all my prayers. It seems like everything is great in Ephesus. Do you think that in Ephesus, the Ephesian Christians are nailing it quite as it seems? Or do you think they're doing pretty well and they've still got room to grow? See, consider what we do know about Ephesus from different places in the Bible. We know that Ephesus had false prophets. We know at some point they begin losing their love for God. We read about that in the book of Revelation. They have young widows who have a number of issues, especially that they've become prone to the false teachers in Ephesus. So we have to be careful to to not think that the churches of the New Testament have it all together and that we can look at them and say we've got to do things just like uh, the Christians in the New Testament did because if we do it like they did, we'll never have problems in the same way that they never had problems. Oh, really? The Bible talks over and over about problems for those early Christians. They have all kinds of issues going on. Paul is not seeing perfection, but listen, he is viewing his brothers and sisters through eyes of grace. Pastor Tony Morita said it is easy to be critical of others, but it takes a mature believer to see grace in others. Do you wear the glasses of self-righteousness and self-centeredness or do you wear the glasses of grace? Are you looking for grace in the lives of other people? Are you extending grace to other people? Are you loving people well as you love God well? Don't err on one side or the other. In the same way that you can't err on the side of, of sentimentality and just letting everything go, you can't err on the side of 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 truth and beating people over the head with the Bible. It just doesn't work. That's not what Jesus did. He had compassion on the woman who was caught in adultery. But He also told her, go and sin no more. There has to be a balance of loving God and loving other people. A balance of truth and grace. Paul prays a prayer of thanksgiving for the Christians because he's viewing them through eyes of grace. So he prays this prayer of thanksgiving, but his second prayer is the prayer that they would experience God. In verse 17, we read that he remembers uh, the, the Christians in his prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. Paul uses some important words. First, he talks about the spirit of wisdom. He's talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in our experience of God. He's not simply talking about some idea or some goal for wisdom. Like we use that word spirit of whatever, uh, the spirit of St. Louis and uh, spirit of all kinds of things. Uh, we, We talk about that, but that's not what Paul is doing. Paul is talking about someone specific. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. 
God the Holy Spirit. And then he uses this this phrase, the revelation of the knowledge of God. Revelation of the knowledge of God. This is not some passive idea. He's praying that God would openly reveal himself to us. It's the idea that God is is letting us know who he is. But, But in the Bible, knowledge is not simply about the accumulation of facts or of grasping ideas. It's something much deeper. And so Paul goes into that and he he says that that you may have the eyes of your heart enlightened. The heart in the Bible is the center of the will and of emotions. So Paul is praying that God would open people's spiritual eyes. See, Paul believed and we believe because the Bible teaches that God wants to give spiritual insight to people. God doesn't take great joy in keeping people in the dark Otherwise, he would not tell us to go and be salt and light in the world. Like, God wants people to know him and love him and be in relationship with him. There are great evidences of God's desire to reveal himself. The author of the book of Hebrews even says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. The writer of Hebrews is telling us that God revealed Himself through people whom He chose to reveal Himself through. That's the prophets. That's the Word of God. By the way, that's still the primary way that God reveals Himself to us. But, he said that in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son. That's why we don't just have the Old Testament. We also have the New Testament. We have the Gospels that record the teachings and the sayings and the life of Jesus. Today, God continues to reveal Himself through His Word. He's given us the Bible so that we can know Him and love Him and experience Him. The Bible teaches us all that we need to know about who God is and what God desires from us. And we learn through the power of the Holy Spirit through the preaching and the teaching of the Bible, how to apply God's Word to our life. And so what do we learn from Paul's prayer of, that we would experience God? He says we're never going to experience God apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. It's never going to happen. Charles Spurgeon, this famous uh, Baptist preacher in England, once said that apart from the Holy Spirit, it's easier to teach a tiger vegetarianism than it is to teach an unregenerate person the Gospel. How easy do you think it is to teach a tiger to be a vegetarian? You can't even teach me to be a vegetarian. And I was born with teeth to chew the cud. I just don't like to. I told somebody last night I like vegetables, but I like them secondhand. Cows eat corn, I eat cows. It's great. But we cannot understand God apart from the Holy Spirit revealing it to us. I'm telling you, you could pick this Bible up and you could read it front to back. You could memorize every page of Scripture. But if there is no Holy Spirit, you will never know God. The Holy Spirit makes what is not perceivable to us able to be seen and heard and felt and experienced. If that doesn't make sense, maybe an illustration would be helpful. We know that whales and dolphins are able to communicate with one another through a series of clicks and whistles and other kinds of vocalizations. In fact, from a boat, you can hear it even when you're not in the water. It's this amazing thing that you can hear the clicks reverberate off the side of a boat. Uh, And and so there, there was a time, though, that scientists thought that blue whales were mute. They were, they're the largest mammals in the world, they're the largest mammals that we're aware of ever existing, but no one had ever heard a vocalization from a blue whale. It seemed reasonable to people, to scientists who studied and tried to hear them, that because they couldn't hear them, they must not make noises. But then the scientists discovered something. Blue whales are not mute. We just can't hear them because our ears can't register the frequency that they communicate at. They communicate at such a low frequency that we can't hear it. They have powerful voices, but they're just so low pitched that we can't perceive them. But once we use the right instruments, we discovered that the voice of a blue whale can be heard by another blue whale hundreds, if not a thousand miles away. Once you fine tune those instruments enough, a blue whale's song that's sung in New York Harbor can be heard 
and, and, and um, can be perceived and received as far away as England. You just have to have the instruments of detection tuned to detect the voice of a blue whale in order to hear it. Otherwise, you'll think that the blue whale is silent. There are many of us who think that God is silent because we don't hear Him, that God is not acting because we do not see Him, that God is mute because our spiritual instruments are not tuned to hear Him speak. And that's what Paul prays for. He prays that God would tune the spiritual instruments of our lives to hear God's voice and to see God work so that we can experience God. He's praying that your ears would be tuned to hear the God whose voice is so powerful that it spoke the blue whale into being. And the God whose voice isn't detectable across the ocean, but whose voice is proclaimed across the universe. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies above proclaim His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world, all proclaiming the glory of God. Knowledge of God is available. Because God has revealed Himself to us. But we must never confuse knowledge about God for knowledge of God. There is a huge difference. A person can know the Bible front to back but still be as lost as a goose. There are lots of ways that we mask our lostness. I pray. I read the Bible, I study the Bible, I memorize the Bible, I attend church, I attend Sunday school, I tithe, I work, and I minister, and there's even a Bible passage about it. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 7, 21-23, where He says, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of My Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to Me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name and cast out demons in Your name and do many mighty works in Your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew You. Depart from Me, you workers of lawlessness. We mask our lostness in lots of ways. All the things that we attempt for God, all the things that we do for God, all the things that we know about God. But Jesus is telling us there are going to be a lot of really religious people in hell. And they will have done a lot, and they will have worked hard, and they will have attempted to do a lot in the name of Jesus. But they missed out on Jesus. They never called on the name of Jesus to save them. They preached, they knew His Word, but they didn't know Him. So church, don't miss out on Jesus. And one day Jesus met some people on the road. And the story shows us what it's like to experience God. They had seen Jesus crucified. They had heard about His re- resurrection. They believed in Him, but they needed to experience Him. So He comes along on the road, starts talking to them. Along the way, He shares with them through the whole Old Testament how Jesus is who the Bible declares that He is. How the Messiah must suffer, must die, and must be resurrected. He preaches Himself from the entire Old Testament, but they still missed out. They heard the greatest sermon maybe ever preached. And so Jesus goes to eat dinner with them. And when He goes to eat dinner with them, He prays. And when he prays, he breaks a loaf of bread and all of a sudden something happens. Luke 24, 31-32 and then verse 45 talk about it. It says, and their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. And then immediately he vanishes from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the Scriptures? And then Jesus goes and meets with the other disciples, and they don't know who He is either. So verse 45 says, Then He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. See, they could see with physical eyes, but they weren't seeing with spiritual eyes what was right in front of them. Their physical eyes were open, but their spiritual eyes were blind. And you may be a Christian today and still not see what's right in front of you. You you may need your spiritual eyes to be opened by God so you can see what is clear. This is not a one-time opening of our eyes. Paul is writing to Christians that God would open their eyes. It's ongoing. It's this process by by which we experience God through reading, obeying His Word, and growing to become more like Jesus. Knowledge of God goes far beyond facts and familiarity. 
knowing in the Bible goes like this. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. Adam didn't look at his wife and go, hmm, she's this tall, she's this good looking, and now she's this pregnant. Because I know some facts about her. No, in the Bible, knowing is about experiencing. And there is a great difference between knowing the truth and experiencing the truth, between getting the truth in your mind and between living the truth in your life. And it's a simple word. That simple word is love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes to the church of Corinth and says, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just noise, empty noise. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I memorize the Bible. Do you love people? I can explain every verse of Scripture, but do you love people? Are you walking in love? Like the Ephesian Christians, we need to love God more. And we need to love one another more. But we don't need to simply know about God. We need to experience God. And we need to become like God. Paul prays that the Ephesians would experience God. That took 22 minutes. We're halfway through my sermon. (laughs) Paul's next prayer is he prays for the Ephesians to have hope of God's calling. He says in verse 18, having the eyes of your heart enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So, we have hope, and and this is what Paul's talking about. We have hope because we know that the world is in God's control. This world may seem out of control, but it is not. God is not in heaven going, oh my goodness, what's going to happen with the impeachment hearings? God is in heaven saying, I'm on my throne, I'm in control, don't worry about it. I've got this. We have hope because we know that God is in control and God is restoring order to the world. Now, we perceive, because we look around and see how things are getting worse, that things are only going to get worse. But, the book declares to us something else. That God is going to restore order. Things are not going to fall apart. Al Gore talked about the the earth being flooded and we're going to lose all these seasons and all these things because the earth is warming. Two weeks ago, I thought Al Gore, once again, you missed it, dude. It's like negative 40 outside. You should have heard Jacob complaining. He hates cold weather. It was awful. Uh, He was crying in his office and the tears were freezing, flowing down his face. Like, Everything's falling apart, and then this summer's going to come, and I'm going to be doing what Jacob was doing. I'm going to be in my office crying because it's so stinking hot. Like, I don't like that. This is fat boy weather right now. Summer is not fat boy weather. It is, that is too hot. Okay? So, but all the, the polar ice caps are going to melt, and we're all going to drown. No, we're We're not. We are going to be fine because God is in control. Does that mean that we need to be responsible? Yes. Does that mean that we might need to make changes? Sure. Does that mean that we can twist God's arm to finally get things under control? No stinking way. God is in control. And we can have hope in a world of hopelessness because we know that we are called by God And look what he says. The hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? When we read that, we think inheritance in the saints. God's talking about heaven. Well, he kind of is, but he's talking about something else too. 
See, we inherit eternal life because of what Jesus has done for us. We inherit heaven. But have you ever thought about the fact that you are God's inheritance too? God has a glorious inheritance in the saints. And that is you and that is me. Now, I've received inheritances, small inheritances, a couple of times. When my dad died, when my grandma died, we got a little bit of money. It was, it was nice, but it, it, we had it, and then it was gone. Glorious inheritances are never gone. Like, this inheritance lasts forever. The inheritance that we receive in eternal life, relationship with God forever, it never goes away. But the inheritance that God receives in us never goes away either. God has a glorious inheritance in the saints. Have hope. Have hope that you are God's and we are good. So Paul prays this prayer that we would have hope in God's calling. But then his last prayer, he says this. He says in verse 19, And what is the immeasurable greatness of of His power toward us who believe. The immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. According to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and all authority and all power and all dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. When Paul writes these words, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Here it is. According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ. He says, he says, according to the power of his power of his power. Like it's so good that Paul just uses the same words over and over and over again. Power of his power of his power. Like, like, God's power is great. It's so great that Paul calls it immeasurable greatness of His power. The, the, the magnitude of His power cannot even be quantified or understood. Like we can understand how much power the sun gives off. We can understand how much power an explosion has. We can understand a lot of power, but we can never understand the power of God. And that power, Paul says, is power toward us who believe. In other words, it's power for us to walk in and to experience. If you're a Christian, you can experience God's power. The power to resist sin. The power to influence the world for Jesus. The power to share the gospel. The power to live a transformed life. That power is available to us who believe. And you can experience it on your own because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, but you will never experience the fullness of God's power through the Holy Spirit by yourself. Here's how we know. Because in verse 22 it says, He put all things under His feet and gave Him head over all things to the church. The church which is His body. The church which is the fullness of Him who fills all in all. The fullness of God's power is never experienced by a Christian by their self. The the fullness of God's power is only experienced as we gather together as His church. The experience of God God and of God's hope and of God's power come from Christ to His gathered people because the church is God's plan to fill the universe with His purpose. And the church is God's presence in the world. And the church is God's choice of vessel for His Holy Spirit. The church is God's gathered people. And so, there are no mavericks or deserters. We can never experience God's plan in our lives apart from the church. Anytime you see Christians in the Bible, you always see them connected to the local church. They're accountable to one another. They're learning from one another. They're submitting to one another. They're providing for one another. They're responsible for one another. You never see Christians in the Bible who are alone. Like, we we read about the the um, Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts who who Philip led to Christ uh, going along the road and and the Ethiopian eunuch gets baptized and he goes to Ethiopia and what we know from church history, what we know from the church fathers who, who were around right after the Bible was written who wrote things, 
the Ethiopian eunuch goes back to Ethiopia. What's he do when he gets there? He starts sharing the gospel and he builds a church. He put, brings God's people together to worship together. The gospel goes to a city. A few people get saved. They start gathering together and they form a church in that city all throughout the book of Acts. The Bible knows nothing of Christians who are not connected to the church. But Americans, we're, we're ruggedly individualistic people. We live like we don't need one another, even though we know it's a lie. We require one another, and the Bible commands us to live in submission to other Christians who constitute the church. <coughs> when we ignore the church, we, we live like a soldier who has no supply lines. You study military history, you see that that's the way armies are defeated. They're defeated when you cut off their supply lines. We're blessed because we have radio preachers and podcasts. If you don't know what that is, never mind. We have books. We have study Bibles. We have conferences and lots of Christian leaders that we can learn from. I learn from those people. I've got an office full of books. But if you take all that stuff, all those great things that we can have outside the local church, and you put it together in one container, and then you weigh it against the value of belonging to a church, there is no comparison. God always intends for His people to be connected to a local church. The Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-living church is God's plan for our spiritual growth. And settling for those substitutes is like eating tofu instead of a ribeye. It is a lousy substitute. You don't believe me? I, I, had a, I had a cousin who was a vegetarian. And one time I asked him, don't you miss anything about being a vegetarian? He goes, at Thanksgiving, I miss turkey. I said, well, then why don't you just eat turkey? He goes, well, it's okay. They have tofu turkey. I said, tell me about tofu turkey. He said it tastes just like turkey, but the texture is horrible. He said it's like chewing on a sponge. I said, you know what you can do to fix that? He said, what? I said, eat turkey. It's pretty simple. It's a lousy substitute. But there are lots of us who are settling for tofu turkey when the real thing is right there and available. On every street corner in America, it seems like. Like, you can't go anywhere in small town America, like where we live, Midwest, Southeast, and not find a church. Now, that's not true in the Northeast, and that's not true in most of the western part of the United States. But where we live, there's a church, here's a church, there's a church. There's a church over there. There's a couple churches over there. Like, there's churches everywhere. Like... We don't even have to try. You have to try to not see a church. But God's church is God's plan for God's people to know God and to experience God. There's no such thing as maverick Christians in the Bible. There's no such thing as deserters in the Bible. No one Christian is the church. And no one person can ignore the church. You can't love Jesus and not love His wife. Ignoring the bride is ignoring her husband. There is no maverick. There is no deserter. But there also is no despair. The church is flawed. The church is imperfect. The world seems to be winning at times. The church's influence doesn't seem to be very strong at times. Sometimes churches have like, if you don't watch this, but if you know what this is, you'll understand. Like crazy Uncle Eddie's. Like, church has those the Christmas vacation don't watch it um, unless it's on TV and then it still don't watch it um, but but we have we have warts and we have problems but Jesus is clear the gates of hell will not prevail against his church the church will be victorious because the church is the bride of Christ Jesus wins and because the groom wins his bride will be victorious there is no despair and there is no surrender don't stop you share your faith. You talk about Jesus. You worship Jesus. You be faithful to Jesus. You love people. You serve people. Don't give up. Don't surrender. The church of Jesus will not surrender. 
the church of Jesus will live in the power of God for the glory of God that comes through the Holy Spirit. People might surrender, but the church never will. So don't surrender. And by the way, I understand what some of you may be thinking. Well, the, the church, the church in the Bible refers to all God's people uh, over time and, and throughout history, and that's true. But in the book of Ephesians, the church refers to the local church every time. So it's not simply about, well, I'm saved, so I'm part of the church. Well, you, you kind of are, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about this. He's talking about the local church, God's plan for the world. Paul prays a prayer of thanksgiving, seeing Christians through eyes of grace. Paul prays a prayer that those Christians would experience God, that they would know God, that they would have a deepening relationship with God. Paul prays that they would have hope of God's calling. And Paul prays that they would walk in power together, in God's power together. Not in the power of First Baptist Church of Ephesus or First Baptist Church of Casey or whatever church it is, but that they would walk in God's power. Christian, this is available to you. This is, this is Paul's prayer for you, but it is God's word. So it is God's desire for you. This is what God wants for you. So our invitation to you as our musicians come and prepare to lead us in a time of invitation today is will you experience Jesus today? Maybe you're not a Christian and you need to experience Jesus for the first time. You need to trust Jesus to save you and, and you need to begin following Him forever. You need to ask Him to forgive your sin and to give you a relationship with God. And the Bible promises that if you will do that, you will be saved and you will receive a relationship with God through Jesus today. Will you experience Jesus for the first time? And if you are a Christian, will you experience Jesus as you continue to follow Him and you continue to become more like Him by connecting to a church that is a church that worships and serves Him through baptism and church membership. I believe that we are one of those churches, but I know we are not the only ones. And so if this is not the place that God is needing you to get plugged in and to be a member of this church, then you find that church. You find that place that God wants you to be. You can experience Jesus by building relationships and growing alongside other Christians through Sunday school or Bible study. Throughout the Bible, we see that Christians are are encouraging one another, we're sharpening one another, we're causing one another to become more like Christ as we encourage one another and spur one another on as we follow after Jesus. Maybe it's by showing the love of Jesus to someone by serving them with no expectation of return or reward for us, not because we want to get something, but because we want to give, because we want to extend the love of Jesus. Maybe... You need to experience Jesus by growing in re your relationship with God through Bible reading and Bible study and prayer and worship and giving. These are all ways that we submit to and do the will of God. Or maybe it's by telling somebody else about the Jesus who has loved you and who has saved you and, and what He's done for you. What sin have you been choosing to justify that you need to leave behind? What are the things that have become a priority over your personal time with God and your walk alongside other Christians? Will you walk away from those things today? Will you, will you say, I don't, I, don't just, I don't need to do this on my own. I need, to, I need to live in the power of God walking with other people. Will you recommit today to following Jesus? Will you pray that God will do that work in your life to help you experience Him and to follow Him and to, to be more like Him? Will you experience Jesus today, Christian? Whether you're a Christian, whether you're not a Christian, we want to give you the opportunity today to experience Jesus, whether it's for the first time or for the first time in a while, or maybe to experience Him in a deeper way than you ever have before. Jacob and I will be waiting for you to talk with you and pray with you about the decision that you have. Will you come? Father, we love you. We thank you for the word that you have provided to us, the, this prayer for us, that we would know God and experience God and walk with God and, and live in the power of God. Father, we thank you for that prayer. We thank you that it's not just the prayer of a man, but it's the desire of God for his people. And so today, Father, we give you our hearts, we give you our lives, and we pray that you would show us in these moments how you would have us to follow you. 
what you would have us to do in response to you. So lead us now, we pray, in Jesus' name.